Let me say it another way. What you think about marriage determines how you approach dating. What you think about marriage determines how you approach dating, and vice versa, how you, how you think about dating if you're in a relationship is going to be dragged into how you view marriage. So you want to get it straight. The Bible doesn't talk about dating per se, but it talks about marriage. So we're going to approach dating through understanding its goal, which is marriage. Make sense? Good? So, <laughs> so I, I hope that the next couple weeks uh, will we'll reverse the trend that a lot of us are kind of in, where we just kind of soak in what's going on in the world, soak in what we see in the media, soak in what we see on TV and in the movies, that t- tell us what love, what romance, what marriage is. <clears throat> As most of you guys know, uh, the movies never show you what marriage looks like, usually. Like, if it's a happy ending, it's usually happily ever after, and the marriage is assumed, right? And if it shows marriage, it usually shows marriage as sad and depressing and, and, and walking in, right? That's what the movies portray, but I hope over the next two weeks, you will see what the Bible says, and you will learn to love and appreciate and honor marriage as biblically defined. So, this week we're going to walk through Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. And we're going to be talking primarily about marriage tonight. Primarily tonight is going to be about marriage. Because what you think about marriage, again, determines how you approach dating, right? And then next week we'll talk a little bit more specifically about some practical principles and guidelines for dating. Though uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of that tonight as well, but most of that will be next week. Because I think once you have the understanding, the foundation of what marriage is, Dating becomes a lot more clear to understand and talk about. So, let's jump in. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. We're going to start reading in verse 21. This is what the Word of God says. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So, husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So now even just reading through that once, I hope there's something that popped out. I hope something caught your eye even just reading through that passage once. And I hope it's clear that, that behind marriage, behind the instruction that Paul gives to the wife and to the husband, there's a foundational truth. There's a foundational truth. And Paul hints at it in his instructions to the wives. Paul makes it a little bit more clear in his instructions to the husband. And he, he builds up this argument until there's this climax in verse 32 where Paul unveils the, the main motivation, the main foundation of what he's saying. Verse 32 says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to what? Christ and the church. This is the high point of the section. This is the banner, the thesis, the main idea that controls the rest of verses 22 to 33. All those verses flies under this banner of, this is talking about Christ and the church. That's the foundational truth behind everything that he's saying. 
The reason he says to wives submit, the reason why he says to husbands love, is because marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. In other words, marriage is a picture of the gospel. This is how John Piper explains it, talking about the same passage. He says, marriage is patterned after Christ's covenant relationship to his redeemed people, the church. And therefore, the highest meaning and the most ultimate purpose of marriage is to put the covenant relationship of Christ and his church on display. That is why marriage exists. Now, if you don't get that, then none of Ephesians 5 will make sense to you. If you don't get that the point of marriage is to point to Christ and the church, then Ephesians 5, 22-33 won't make a lot of sense to you. If you ask the average person, what is marriage all about, you probably get answers like, marriage is about falling in love, right? Like gravity. <laughs> What's marriage all about? It's about making you happy. Find that person that fulfills your life. No. That's, that's what you would hear. That's kind of the typical response you hear. But biblically speaking, that's not true. Biblically speaking, the point of marriage is to put Christ and the church on display. It's to put the gospel on display. Again, reading uh, another Piper quote here. He says, staying married, therefore, and listen to this, staying married, therefore, is not mainly about staying in love. It is about keeping covenant. It is about keeping covenant. Till death do us part, or as long as we both shall live, is a sacred covenant promise. The same kind Jesus made with his bride when he died for her. Therefore, what makes divorce and remarriage so horrific in God's eyes is not merely that it involves covenant breaking to the spouse, but that it involves misrepresenting Christ as covenant. Christ will never leave his wife, ever. Marriage is not mainly about being or staying in love. It's mainly about telling the truth with our lives. It's about portraying something true about Jesus Christ and the way he relates to his people. It is about showing in real life the glory of the gospel. Now, I want to start with that, even though Paul finishes with that. He, he ends with that point, but that's the climax of his argument. That's the banner that flies over this whole passage. I want to make that clear up front so that as we go through, it'll, it'll all make sense to you. So as we work our way through verses 22 to 33, we're going to see two ways that marriage puts the gospel on full display. Two ways that marriage puts the gospel on full display. And the first way is for the wives. It's for the wives. And it's that submission, submission displays Christ. Or sorry, two ways that marriages put the gospel on full display. First way, submission that displays Christ in the church. Submission that displays Christ in the church. Look again at verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. Or, or you could say, wives, submit to your own husbands. And some of you guys who are maybe looking at a couple different versions of translation, it might have the word, be subject, in italics. How many guys have that? Okay, very few people. Well, some translations are more literal. Do that. Um, and, and I remember when I uh, got a Bible for a friend of mine who was a new believer, and he was reading, he would, he would do like this. Wives, be subject to your own husband. And, and the funny thing is, you know, a friend of mine said a joke, like, you wanted to go through and make a sermon about all the words that were italicized that they were emphasized. And, and in case you don't know, the, the reason why they're in italics is because they're not there in the original Greek. But they're there in the English because it helps you connect grammatically what's going on. Because in verse 20, 21, uh, it says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Verse 22, it says, wives, to your own husbands. The, the, it's implied there, wives, be subject, submit to your own husbands. Now, what is what does uh, submit mean? Because this is, ooh, this is this is like dangerous talk here. If you say this, you say this out in public, you know, people will stone you today. 
Wives, be subject to your own husbands. What does that mean? Does that mean wives are to be doormats? They're to be obedient slaves to their husbands? No. Absolutely not. I, I saw Karen just hit Jack, so I think Jack probably said yes. <laughs> <laughs> what does submit mean? Submit does not mean obey. That's a different word later. Oh, children, obey your parents. A different word. This is submit. And this has the idea of, of a voluntary... Uh, Willful yielding of self. In the Greek, it's called, it's, it's in not the active voice or the passive voice, it's what is called the middle voice in Greek, which means that it's something you do to yourself or for yourself. So in other words, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. This isn't a call for husbands, go and subjugate your wives. Absolutely not. This is, this is saying wives, voluntarily, of your own will, though you are an equal in every respect of importance and, and intelligence, maybe even greater in intelligence, <laughs> order yourself under your husband. This is often used in the military, where it's not like, you know, the foot soldier is less valuable as a person in terms of human life. The person on the front line is not less valuable than the general, right? But the soldiers on the front line obey or submit themselves to the general. It's the idea of order. It's the idea of order. I mean, you can understand this, right? You, you have a committee, and that committee is supposed to make some decisions. If you have two people leading that committee, when there's some sort of a standoff, and there's two people, they're, they land on opposite sides of the issue, uh, nothing's going to happen because they disagree. There needs to be one leader. And that leader can't be a dictator, can't be tyrannical about it, but that one leader is going to hear all the different input and make the best decision that he can, and everyone else, in a sense, submits to that. It's for the purpose of order. It's not about value, it's not a value statement, it's not about intelligence, it's not about any of that. It's about order. And so the wife is not coerced into this. She is called to, to voluntarily submit. Voluntarily submit. And so that's what it means. Now to whom does she submit? To whom does she submit? Uh, to her own husband. To her own husband, right? Uh, some people get the idea that I'm a man. All women submit to me. <laughs> Absolutely not. If any of you guys said that, I will slap you upside the head, and ladies, you have my permission to do that too. It says, ladies, submit, women, submit, wives, I should say, wives, submit to your own husbands. Not to every man, but to your own husband. And and, and that's important. It's not this submit to all men everywhere, to your own husband. And then it says, as to the Lord. As to the Lord. This gives you the, the, the motivation, right? Wives, if you are submissive, and most of you aren't wives in this room, but women, this is thinking ahead what marriage is going to be like. You're to submit to Christ, right? All believers submit to Christ. We live under his authority. He saved us. He died for us. He took our sins upon himself. And if he's done that, we want to submit to him, right? Men and women, we want to live in, in obedience to Christ. And here it says, in the same way that you submit to Christ, or not in the same way, but Rather, because you submit to Christ, because you submit to Christ, submit also to your husband. Submit to your husband. Kind of, if you, if you see this umbrella of submission to Christ, within that umbrella, there's a small category of husband. And if you submit to your husband, by submitting to your husband, you also submit to Christ. Now, again, that's not saying be a doormat, never question anything. Uh, it's kind of like you think about our prayers to the Lord. We submit to Christ. We submit to God's will, right? But does that mean that we never pray? We never offer up, uh, Lord, I would really like it if you did this. Lord, I see my circumstances, and God, would you please do this in my life? Would you please remove this difficulty from my life? Would you please open that door, that opportunity in my life? We, we pray that way. We make requests and say, God, uh, I'm not wiser than you, but you put this on my heart, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this request. I think this would be good. I would like 
I would like this to come true. But then at the end of your prayer, you say what? If the Lord wills. Lord willing, would you do this? If it's in your will, would you do this? And so even, even in our prayers, we, we're not doormats, in a sense, but we, we submit to God, yet we can still bring our requests to God. So the wife is to submit, and that doesn't mean that the value statement is an ordering under of an equal. To whom does she submit? Her own husband, not to all men. And she submits to her own husband as an act of submission to Christ. And then why should she submit? Why should she submit? Verse 23, for, that gives the reason. For, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Mm. Why? She submits to her husband because he is her he is her head. What in the world are you talking about? What does that mean? What does that mean, he is her head? Well, it's a metaphor, right? It's just that Christ is the head of the church. And, and that term head, maybe you've heard of the term headship. And it's not like, you know, the head of a boat or something. Uh, headship talks about... Uh, Ryan's like... <laughs> That didn't work. Right. Right. Well, okay. So headship, uh, it, it has the idea of of authority, it has the idea of uh, protection and leadership and provision. Right. The head of the company gives leadership. The head of a company has some 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 sort of authority, and the, the head of a company provides for his employees. The head of a company is to protect his company from, from, from attacks from the outside. And, and so there's a sense in which head here means leadership, protection, and provision. Leadership, protection, and provision. So when it says that Christ is the head of the church, he, he leads the church. His word guides the church, right? But Christ also protects the church, protects us from false teaching, protects us from the dangers of the world, and he provides for us. He provides all of our needs, both physically and spiritually. And those same three categories apply to how the the husband is to be the head of the wife. And in what way is the the husband compared to Christ? Well, it says that the husband is, is also the head. So there's leadership, there's protection, there's provision. And it also says that there's a difference, though, because it says uh, Christ is the savior of the body. Ain't no husband is the savior of his wife, right? And and Christ is perfect, sinless. Uh, There's no husband, as good as he can be, who's going to be sinless and perfect. So there's some differences, but there's some similarities. God says Christ is the head of the church. Husband is the head of the wife. There's some similarities, there's some differences. So it's not like, oh, well, the husband is perfect and he is Christ. Ooh, no, no, no. But, but the wife is to submit to her husband as the church does to Christ. So, so the husband is, is to give leadership, not coerce leadership, but to lead in such a way that, she, that the wife wants to submit. And he's to protect her and provide for her. Now, are there any conditions for the wife's submission? Are there any conditions for the wife's submission? What do you guys think? (laughs) What does it say here? Uh, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body, Verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so the wives also are ought to be to their husbands in everything. Unless, of course, the husband, does it say that? Mm -hmm. Except in the cases where, it doesn't say that. That's kind of scary. Like if I was a woman, I'd be like, what? 
<laughs> Greek manuscripts, like something got lost there. Of course, they got a lot of papyruses, or, or they're, they're not trustworthy. Ink gets wiped off. It definitely had a because or a, an exception clause there. <laughs> there isn't one. Wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. That's a blank check of submission. That is scary look. What if, what if he, he's like a, a lukewarm, mediocre Christian? Or worse yet, what if he's not a Christian? Do I still submit to him? Turn to 1 Peter with me, over to the right of you books. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Peter says this to wives. First Peter 3, 1 and 2, it says this, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Even if that man is not saved, even if that man is unsubmissive to the word of God himself, it says, wives, submit to your husband in everything. Now, there, there is a, a caveat there. There is an exception clause, but it's not going to be as often as you think. The exception is if that husband says, do not do what the Bible explicitly commands you to do. The Bible says, worship the Lord, and the husband says, do not worship the Lord. You've got to say what the apostles said in Acts when they were arrested. Whether it's right to obey man or God, you decide. We're going to obey God. The other flip side of that is if the husband says, you cannot do, or no, hold on, I said that. You must do what the Bible forbids. You must commit murder, for instance. The Bible says do not murder. So there, I'm, I'm, I'm ultimately submitting to Christ. And so if I'm submitting to Christ first, and under that I'm submitting to my husband, well then, as long as he doesn't negate and contradict what Christ is saying, I will submit. But once once the husband says something that is outside, out from under what Christ commands or allows, then, then you have an obligation to say, no, I will not because I'm submitting to Christ first and foremost in my life and to you as a result of that. But I'm not submitting to him. Those shoes do look good on me and I'm not returning them. <laughs> not okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a silly example. <laughs> but I don't like the way he made that decision. I don't think he thought it through well enough. So I'm, you know, he can make a decision. I'm going to sit here and just pout. <laughs> Not okay. Maybe you say, okay, I'll submit. But every chance I get, if he's wrong, I'm going to tell him. He told you. I told you that was a bad idea. It's not submission. If you're waiting for his plan to fail, that's not submission. If you're going to hold it over him, that's not submission. Submission is is in everything. And there are no conditions to that. That's kind of scary. That's a tall order. That's a hard task for wives and women to fulfill. And there is going to be a flip side, so just wait for that. But this is difficult. And, and if I can pull out some application even now for those of you who are not married. I mean, if you're married, it's, it's very clear. Submit to your husband, right? But if you're not, how does this apply? Do you go and just submit to every man because you don't know who's going to be your husband? Uh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Don't do that. But right now, my question to you would be, are you cultivating a heart of submission? Are you cultivating a heart that will gladly submit to whomever God puts in your life as your husband. How you know that is right now, do you gladly submit to your, to your parents? To your dad in particular? Do you gladly and joyfully, as worship unto Christ, submit to your professors or your employer? Are you cultivating a heart of submission or are you hardening your heart and teaching yourself, forming a habit of questioning and nagging and, and being unsubmissive 
to authorities that God puts in your life. That's, I think, a helpful application now, as even as you're single, even as you're looking ahead to marriage, are you cultivating a heart of submission? And another thing I would say, recognize that in marriage, your gift of submission is the greatest gift you can give to your husband. It is, it is a blank check of submission. It's in everything. As long as he doesn't cause you to sin, you submit in everything. This is a great and precious gift. You do not want to give that gift to a fool. You do not want to give that gift to a man that you do not trust will lead you towards Christ. You do not want to give that gift to someone who will abuse it. And to some extent, you can't know for sure, but... That's to say, when you're looking for someone, when, when, when a boy, when a man, <laughs> when a man pursues you, don't just think, he's cute. I'm going to say yes. Think to yourself, is this a man that I trust with my submission? Is this a man that I respect his decisions such that I would submit to him? That would be a helpful question to ask when considering someone as a potential spouse. Husbands, men, future husbands, I would say. Future the wrong guy. <laughs> future husbands, men. You can even learn something from the women's section here. Christ is the head of the church, just as you are to be the head of your future wife. You are to provide leadership protection, and provision. Are you becoming those things now? Are you exhibiting those things now? Do you know what it means to be a leader? Or are you just kind of sitting back and letting other people run the show all the time? Doesn't mean you need to be bossy. Doesn't mean you need to insert yourself and assert yourself. But are you developing leadership? Are you becoming a man who is trustworthy? That a woman would not fear to give you her submission? Are you a man who is fearful, or are you a man who's going to protect those who need protection? Real practical, USC is not in the greatest of areas. Some of you guys are so scared you would probably run home. <laughs> but you instead need to protect the women in our Bible study. And when they go home, if a girl starts walking up, hey, who's walking you back? You know, it's the girl that lives three miles off campus. You're like, darn it. Is there another guy? <laughs> no, you say, can I walk you back? I want to walk. No, no, it's okay. I'm really okay. I'm really okay. I, I would like to walk you back. Ladies, unless the guy creeps you out like big time, don't say no. <laughs> don't say no. Allow the man to be a man. Allow the man to exercise Leadership and protection. Foster that. Encourage that. Don't be like, Psh, I'll protect you on the way home. <laughs> Don't do that. Encourage them. Thank you. Like, thank you for that kind gesture. I, I didn't want to ask anybody, but I'm thankful that you offered. Yes, please walk me back. <laughs> you know? Men, are you that kind of guy? And, and are, you, are you looking forward to being a provider? Are you looking forward to being a provider? Are you thinking about how you can work with your hands and make money so that you can provide not just for yourself, but for a future wife and for future kids? If you don't have that mindset now, you need to start developing that. You're, you're not going to be able to flip the switch and be like total loser one day. You walk down the aisle, say I do, and all of a sudden, da, 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 leadership, protection, and provision. <laughs> You need to start cultivating those things in your life now. Do you have a mindset where you say, I want to work hard. I don't want to be lazy. I'm putting away childish things because I'm a man. Right? Are you, or do you have that kind of a mindset? Be a man. Grow up. I don't want to always pick on video games, but I'm going to pick on video games a little bit. That's not going to pay the bills. Right? Hey. You know, have fun, have some way to relax, that's fine, but if that defines your life, man, women, watch out for those kind of guys. You know? You don't want to submit to the guy who said, 
Hey, while I'm playing another level of Halo, can you grab me some chips? You know? So, men, learn what it means to be a good leader, a, a strong protector, and a, and a good provider. Women, look for that kind of a man. Look for that kind of a man. Again, marriage is not about making you happy, primarily. It's not about staying in love, primarily. Marriage is about putting Christ and the church on display. And wives, future wives, women, you have an opportunity to do that in how you want to submit to your husband in the future. And you have an opportunity to learn how to do that even now in, in the different areas where God has put you under whoever it is that's over you in some capacity, whether it's in school, in the family, or at work. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. Husbands. This is number two. The second way that, that marriages can, can, uh, display the gospel, display Christ in the church. Husbands, this is for you. Love that displays Christ in the church. Love that displays Christ in the church. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. You guys know that term, gave himself up for her, is referring to what? You get some time. Dad. The cross. Jesus Christ paying for the sins of his bride. And this is, this is the heart of, of, of everything that, that we believe, right? The cross is at the heart of, of the gospel, of everything that is important to us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ would die for us. That on the cross, Jesus didn't die for his, his own sins. He died for the sins of another. For us. This is a, a sacrificial love, right? This is a love that is absolutely, completely selfless. To be called to imitate Christ in his death on the cross is the highest call you men can have. That is the highest call you can have. The highest call is not to be the CEO of a successful company. The highest call is not to be at the top of your class. The highest call you can have in life is to represent Christ and to imitate Christ in his love on the cross. Husbands, future husbands. Again, I'm saying husbands, but you get what I'm saying. Men, when people see your love, the world is supposed to see Calvary. Let that stink in your mind for a minute. When they see the way that you're going to love your future wife, that is supposed to represent Calvary. That's, that's a high calling. There is no greater task for a man than to do that. Marriage is not about what makes you happy. Primarily, it is about you representing Christ? Are, are you becoming that kind of man who loves selflessly? Are you the kind of man who loves even when it's inconvenient to you, or even when it costs you, or even when it hurts? Whether it hurts you financially or emotionally. Are you that kind of man? Are you developing that kind of a heart that loves sacrificially for someone else who cannot pay you back? It's easy to love someone who's going to love you back. It's easy to love someone who you know is going to make you happy. But can you love someone who might never pay you back? You need to be growing in that kind of love. Let me ask you a question. Same thing that I asked the women. Are there any conditions to this kind of love? Are there any conditions to this kind of love? What do you think? No. No. Doesn't say, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her if they submit. Husbands love your wives and just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her 
if they make you happy, if they do what you want, if you find them attractive, if you, there, there, there's no condition there. Husbands, love your wives, not because she's worthy, not because of anything that says love her. There's a blank check command, love her, period. If she's your wife, you must love her. That's what marriage is. There's a covenant made on that wedding day. You know, the reason why people give the ring, you know, I've heard people say, well, they've chosen the ring. Who never, who doesn't choose a ring? I don't know. <laughs> they've chosen this ring because it's precious, like love, and it's a circle, never ending, like love. I don't have a huge, okay, I have a slight problem with that. But it's okay, it's okay, but that's not the main point. The point of the ring is to be a sign of a covenant that you make that day. You guys, you guys know in the Old Testament when God made a covenant with Noah, I'll never flood the earth again, he set a rainbow in the sky as a sign of the covenant. When Christ died on the cross, before that, the, the night he was betrayed, he, he had uh, broke the bread, this is my body, take it and eat. Here's the, the, the wine, this is my blood given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, because this is the blood of the new covenant. So when he died, he he ratified the new covenant by which we're saved. And, and so when we take communion, that's a sign of what he's done. So on the marriage day, when you say, I do, till death do us part, for better or worse, I will love this woman, and you put this ring on, you have made a covenant, a promise before God and these witnesses that you will love that woman no matter what. She doesn't submit to me. She doesn't do what I ask her to do. In, in fact, she's rebellious. She doesn't raise the kids how I want them to be raised. I don't even think she's a believer. None of those get you out of your covenant. You've made a promise. And that's what marriage is about. It's about keeping your covenant. Because Christ keeps his covenant to his unfaithful bride. So men, there, there's no condition to this love. Love your Wives, you marry who you marry. Compatibility is not the issue. That's why I mean, many, if not most, of the marriages throughout history have been what arranged, and they work. Why do they work? Because they understand the idea of commitment and covenant keeping. They understand it's not about compatibility. They understand it's not about just staying in love. They understand that I have made a promise to love whom I have married. The world says, marry whom you love. Here it says, love whom you marry. Love whom you marry. Now, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is Deuteronomy 7, 7 to 8. In the Old Testament, God had his chosen people, Israel, and he was in a covenant relationship with them as well. And sometimes people ask, well, why did he choose Israel? Why did he make a covenant with them? Why were they the chosen people? And Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8, explains. It says this, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The Lord didn't love you because of anything in you, he said to Israel. The Lord loved you and set his love on you because he loves you. Let me say it again. The Lord loves you because he loves you. There's sovereignty there. There's, there's a choice there. There's, there's, uh, it's, it's not conditional. It is unconditional. And you guys know I, I believe strongly in the sovereignty of God and salvation. You know, sometimes the term Calvinist gets a bad rap. So if you have bad connotations of what it means to be Calvinist, I'm not a Calvinist. 
But if you understand Calvinism biblically, I'm a Calvinist. Uh, what I mean by that is God sets his love on whom he chooses to set his love upon. It is not anything in you. It is because God is love and he's chosen to love certain people. And I will tell you this, um, someone who really understands the doctrine of election, someone who really understands God's sovereignty and salvation, will understand what it means to love far better. To love, as it says in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. In other words, love her because you love her. Love her because you've promised. Love her because you've chosen to love her. Only a Calvinist can really do that. No Arminian can do that. Well, uh, see, God loves me because I loved him first. Like, he chose me because I chose him first, so that's cool. So for my wife, uh, because she loves me, then I'll love her. No. Whether or not she loves you, you love her. You get that? Now, if you have questions about it, come talk to me later. I love to talk about that. About God's sovereignty and election. I love that. But you've got to understand, God's love is not conditional. God loves because he loves. God loves because he is love, and we're called to imitate that. That is a high calling, man. That is a high calling of women. Look for a man who gets that. Look for a man who understands that. Look for a cow. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, because if you, if you were, then you would wait for him to find you, because that's a cow. <laughs> wow. I <laughs> order joke. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna wind this down a little more quickly. Uh, People say to me, what should I have on my list? What should I look for in a wife? Like, here's my list. Ha ha. She should be A, B, C, D. All these things, right? And I like to tell people, oh, let me see your list. <laughs> Burn it up. <laughs> I am against the list for this reason. For this reason. Because in marriage, you would better not have a list. In marriage, you would better not have a list. Well, see, I, 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 I dated her, I courted her, you know, because she met conditions A, B, C, D, and E. And now she no longer meets C and E, so therefore I do not love her anymore. I am against lists for that reason. Now, there's a place with wisdom for saying, you know, okay, this is Lord willing, the kind of person I'd like to pursue. I get that, so I'm kind of overstating my case a little bit. But by and large, if you if you are looking for a girl by your list, hmm, A, B, C, please have to go there. No, <laughs> you you are setting yourself up for discontentment in marriage, for for selfishness in marriage. I mean, take that list and burn it up. Love is not about anything in the person you love. It's a it's a choice that you make. And I, I, I love how Vody Bakken puts it. He says, this is love. He says, love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of the object. Love is an act of the will, choice, accompanied by emotion, not led or determined by, that leads to action on behalf of the object. Love is a choice. It's more than a choice. It's emotions, but it's never just emotions. It's never just emotions. Oh, I, you know, so you think of the person who says, I love you, in a dating relationship kind of idea, right? Oh, I love you. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is, I feel happy when I see you. Because if you, if you love them the way love is described here in Ephesians 5, you love unconditionally. You love with a commitment. You love with a promise that my love will never change by God's grace. So I, I don't throw around, around the word love flippantly. Because love means so much more. It's a covenant promise in this context. Now I understand, you know, oh, I love pizza. Oh, I love you, man. <laughs> okay, fine, I get that. But in a, in a romantic kind of relationship, that's a strong word. It's a strong word that carries a lot with it. Love is an act of the will, accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of the object. 
not just, hey, I feel happy when I see you. It's, I will do what I must for your benefit, even if it comes a great sacrifice to myself. No list involved there. The Bible never says, go find this kind of woman. It says, you know, this kind of woman is worthy to be praised in Proverbs 31. But it doesn't say, you must now go find that one, because underneath that idea of having a list is this idea of what pleases me. If you have a list, it's what am I looking for? What would make me happy? And if you go into dating with selfishness, then you will drag that into marriage and be selfish. So I am I'm against lists, because I think, biblically speaking, love is against lists. So, so men, man up. Man up and learn to die to self and love like this. Reflect on what Christ has done for you. Christ died for his unfaithful, sinful, dirty bride. Man up, die to self and Follow Christ. This is not a wimpy kind of love. This is not a sappy kind of love. And emotions should come. It should not be a cold, I do what I do for you because I love you. Not, <laughs> not that. There are emotions, but it's not just emotions. It's a choice and it's a commitment. And this is a man, man up. Learn to love like that. And you will make a wife happy. Even if she doesn't do the things she's supposed to. I mean, wives do this, husbands do this. It never says, make sure your, your spouse does this too. It just says, you need to be who you need to be. You are responsible to do what you are responsible to do. You are to fulfill your end of the covenant promise. When you say, I do, you do not say, if she does too. When, when, ladies, when you say I do, it's not if he does too, it is just I do. Period. Period. Alright. We're running out of time here. What does this love do? Verse 26, it sanctifies her, having washed her with the washing, uh, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that should be holy and blameless. Um, this kind of sacrificial love pursues her purity and pursues her righteousness. Not self-seeking, it is seeking the best for her. She would be pure and righteous and presented to Christ in that way. That has massive implications for dating, for purity. Your wife is not your own, men. You present her to Christ. And how much less so is your girlfriend of yours? You not only present her to Christ, but you present her in a sense to whoever her future husband is. If it's not you. Verse 28 to 31. Husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Uh, it's not just that, that she's your your bride, but it's that she's part of your own body. This is the idea that the two shall become one flesh in marriage. right? Genesis 2, 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall be joined together and be one flesh. If you are, if, when you marry your wife, she is to be not, not another part of you, but she is you. And you care for her as yourself. It's not trying to, you know, consider, well, I can do something for myself or do something for her. It's do something for myself or do something for myself. And and a man who loves his wife is not praiseworthy because it's like you wouldn't say, man, I love how Gary feeds himself when he's hungry. <laughs> isn't that awesome? Like, isn't he so loving? And then when Gary is dirty, he actually cleans himself. <laughs> like, isn't that great? He's such a loving guy, right? And Gary's like, what's going on? Why are you doing all this? <laughs> But you guys, you guys get the point. I mean, a husband who loves his wife? Yeah, duh! She's your own body! Duh! Oh, you're such a great husband, man. You love your No! That's right, you should do that. That's, that's the response. 
It's your own flesh. Your own flesh. So, okay, to understand dating, you must first understand the covenantal, unconditional nature of marriage. Paul never says, look for this kind of husband, look for this kind of wife. He just talks to people who are already married and says, now live this out. Live out Christ in the church. Live out the gospel. When people see your marriage, they are to see the gospel. And I'll tell you this, uh, having worked uh, while I was married and, and working with people who were married, I mean, I had coworkers who, they came to work and they just complained about their marriages. They came to work and they wanted to stay late and work overtime so they didn't have to go home. And for me, I'm, I come in and I'm like, I love my wife. She's so great. And it's like 4.30, I'm like, where am I supposed to be 4.30? Drop the pencil, I'm, I'm gone, I'm home. I'm going to see my wife. I'm going to see my body, my own body. <laughs> and and that is such a shock to the world. You guys are still in college. Most of you, I mean, none of you, besides you know, me and Abijah and Jack and Karen, are married. But when you have that kind of relationship, the world goes, "You're weird." <laughs> but then after they say you're weird, they say, "I wish I had that," and I don't, I don't know what makes me different. The way you pursue a dating relationship, the way you conduct your marriage, is to represent and display the gospel. To represent and display the gospel. And if you understand those things about, about marriage, then you are well on your way to having better principles to guide your dating. Now I often wonder how non-believers Stay together. How do non-believers stay together? It's like, it boggles my mind. Like, uh, I was trying to think of a really difficult kind of science or chemistry question. I can't even think of it anymore. So, it just boggles my mind. Like, one of those kinds of things. <laughs> I mean, it, it's like this. If you had a mountain peak like this, narrow, narrow, narrow little peak, and you're trying to balance a boulder on top of that, that's not stable, right? Like you have two people on either side. Hey, are you pushing? Yeah, I'm pushing. Okay, I'm pushing just a little bit. We can keep this thing balanced. Let's keep it going. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, this is great. But the moment someone pushes a little too hard or pushes a little bit too less, the whole thing comes tumbling down. And that's oftentimes the way relationships work in the world, right? I'll scratch your back and you scratch mine. As long as you make me happy, I'll make you happy. But the moment you do something that I do not like, it's over. Because there's no idea, there's no, there's no concept of commitment and covenant and unconditional love. And so this unstable situation. Whereas for the Christian who submits themselves to the word of God and lives this out, it's like placing a boulder at the bottom of a valley. Woman, whether you submit to me or not, I will love you. Man, husband, whether whether you love me or not, I will submit to you. And you have this valley. And this boulder's down there, and you can you can push and keep pushing and keep pushing, but eventually it'll still come back down to the middle and be stable. I want you guys to have that vision of, of marriage now while you're single. So that when you pursue marriage, when you are married, you come here and you, you, you remember, you, you understand your responsibility to fulfill these roles, not just to have a happy marriage, not just to fulfill these roles, but so that, so that you can put Christ and the gospel on display. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference Christ and the church. Nevertheless, summary statement, verse 33, nevertheless, each individual among you is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must see to it 